We live in a world that is very diverse. In our best of moments, this diversity blesses the community with various colors, sounds, smells, feelings, thoughts, languages. It makes our life experience rich. In our worst of moments, this diversity tears apart the community with walls and categories, prejudices, stereotypes, segregation. The beauty of diversity turns into the ugliness of divisiveness. There is a lot about our world that is different from Jesus' world, but the struggle with human division is similar. I'd like to share a story from Jesus' ministry. In the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, there is a story about a mother who experienced racism, but in faith stood up for her daughter's worth and right to receive healing. In Mark, it is a story about a Seraphonician woman, and in Matthew, it is about a Canaanite woman. Regardless, both describe the woman as someone who is not Jewish and who is from a culture that is looked down on by the Jews as a lesser race. Both tell of a mother who reaches out to Jesus, desperately wanting healing for her daughter. In both versions, the woman meets with significant resistance. In Matthew, the disciples push her aside and then Jesus speaks harshly. Mark doesn't mention the disciples, but has Jesus speaking very harshly to her. Many commentaries have speculated on this situation and why Jesus responded so harshly in the early exchange with the woman. Here's what we read in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Some say Jesus was trying to teach a lesson to the disciples. Possibly. For me, there's comfort in imagining Jesus tired, frustrated, and just plain cranky. It helps me connect with Jesus as a human. I don't know about you, but I definitely have those moments when the burdens of my day lead me to respond in inappropriate ways. Like many of the stories in the Bible, we are left with more questions than answers. Regardless of what Jesus said, as the story is told, the woman did not allow the spoken racism to stop her plea. She demanded that her daughter deserved attention. As a mother, it is easy for me to imagine having this strength if I were fighting for the well-being of one of my children. A mother's love is strong, and I know I would do anything for my own children, even now that they are adults. But having courage to speak out for me or for someone else's children is sometimes a different story. Besides picturing myself in the mother's shoes, I have to confess there have been moments in my life when I was like the disciples. The real problem is that when I am working my agenda 
and the tasks I need to do in life, I don't even realize that I may be pushing people aside and not hearing what they are trying to say. I may not be seeing them or valuing them. And I definitely know there are times when I responded as Jesus did with harsh words. And in my case, I can't claim that my motive was using the situation as a teaching moment. Today, you come together to take part in communion. At the communion table, we see the bread. Bread is one of the most basic elements that sustain life. We know that it represents the body of Christ, but for a moment, also consider bread as a symbol of the poor. I think of the story told in the play Les Miserables. The plot begins with a man arrested for stealing bread from a bakery so he can feed his family. Sitting next to the bread, or a symbol of the poor, is the wine. We know that wine represents the blood of Christ, but for a moment, picture it as a symbol of the rich. Wine is a drink of luxury that is not always available to everyone. I think of the story of how everyone was so surprised after Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding party, because the best wine was usually gone by this hour in the party. These diverse elements come together to create a common or unified experience at the communion table. Similarly, we come from diverse backgrounds, perspectives, life circumstances to this table where we are made one in Christ. Doctrine and Covenants, section 164, paragraph 4b reminds us, when the church gathers for communion, we have the opportunity for members to reaffirm their baptismal covenant, to reconcile strained relationships, and to commit together to the church's mission of promoting communities of generosity, justice, and peacefulness. Let's consider again the symbol of the bread representing the poor and the wine representing the rich. We eat the bread first at communion. All of us are poor in some way, whether economically, spiritually, relationally, or emotionally. Pause for a moment and consider how you feel poor. Be honest. Unlike the Canaanite woman from the Matthew scripture, you don't have to demand a crumb from this table. This table has been prepared for each of you to share in together. Communion by its very name implies something we do together. The Latin root word for communion means fellowship, mutual participation, or sharing. After eating the bread, we drink of the wine. Just as each of us is poor in some way, we are also rich. We may not have financial riches, but we are rich in some way. Again, pause for a moment and consider how you feel rich. And again, be honest. I know you are rich. Maybe, like the Canaanite woman, you are rich in faith. Maybe you are rich because you are sitting with this supportive group of disciples. So think of the process. We eat the bread and remember Christ's body. We remember that even in our most impoverished state, we are invited to this table. There is a place for us and we do not have to beg for the crumbs. We look around to those who are gathered with us. We recognize the worth of each one. We drink the wine and remember Christ's blood. We remember that we are rich and have gifts and blessings to share. 
Again, we look around to the others with whom we are one with Christ and see their giftedness and what we collectively have to share. We remember that we are stronger in living Christ's mission as we leave the table and serve together. Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, paragraph 3a challenges us. More fully embody your oneness and equality in Jesus Christ. Oneness and equality in Christ are realized through the waters of baptism, confirmed by the Holy Spirit, and sustained through the sacrament of communion. Embrace the full meaning of these sacraments and be spiritually joined in Christ as never before. It also goes on to warn us in paragraph 3b, it is not right to profess oneness and equality in Christ through sacramental covenants and then to deny them by word or action. Such behavior wounds Christ's body and denies what is resolved eternally in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the oneness that you will find at the table with yourself, God, and those who come to the table with you must now be extended to others. How are you as individuals and a congregation called to advocate for the Seraphonician or Canaanite mothers in your community? Who else is being excluded or pushed aside and how can you become an advocate for the daughters and sons of the world who deserve healing, wholeness, and a place in God's kingdom? Let me close with a quick personal story. In the late 1990s, two young Latino men carjacked me at gunpoint. They did not hurt me at all, but the experience left me a bit paranoid for a while. It also created a prejudice in me that I hated towards Latino men, and I really struggled to shake my prejudice. Suddenly, I was just like the disciples in the Bible story we read today who judged based solely on ethnicity and gender. Not too long after this event, I went to work full time for the church and my assignment included the Baja California area of Mexico. I found myself making frequent trips with 70 Gina Norton as we worked on planting several locations of the church in this area. Internally, this was a real challenge for me because of this built up fear that I had. But I kept praying and stepping out of my comfort zone to respond to what I sensed God was calling me to do. It was my experiences as I ministered side by side with my brothers and sisters in Tecate and other locations that eventually brought me healing and wholeness as I had the experience to share the communion table with this wonderful community of committed disciples, I found personal healing and wholeness and a new feeling of oneness in Christ. Doctrine and Covenants section 165 paragraph 3c encourages us to continue to learn and look for the unity found in the diversity created by God. You do not fully understand many interrelated processes of human creation. Through its wonderful complexity, creation produces diversity and order. Like the bread and the wine that come together from different backgrounds, representing different scenarios to create a single communion experience, May you be blessed as individuals and as a community to take this experience of oneness in Christ into your homes, workplaces, schools, wherever you live life. May those who know you experience their worth and come to understand their calling 
and invitation to be part of God's kingdom-building process in the world.